Contrary to what many motorcyclists believe, towing a trailer is actually pretty easy. Pulling the weight is not difficult at all, but having the weight act against the bike can be. To reduce this effect on your motorcycle, the hitch on your motorcycle needs to be sturdy and connected to at least four points on your motorcycle's frame. For obvious reasons, no hitch should ever be connected to drive shafts, shock absorbers, swing arms or axles. If the reasons why you shouldn't use these types of hitches isn't obvious to you, they add to your motorcycle's unsprung weight, will dramatically increase wear on swing arm bushes, as well as transmit every single bump in the road right through to your trailer. They are utterly very bad news. You suck! Your hitch needs to be mounted rock solid, with absolutely no movement present in any direction. If you can move your hitch with your hands, your 150 kilo trailer is going to move it a lot more. For this reason, I strongly suggest to anyone not to use any tow hitch made like this one. The down struts on this hitch are just bolted on, and they are bolted on with very small diameter bolts. That said, the strut should actually be welded and not bolted anyway. There is also no bracing, and the thin flat bar steel used is more flexible than a Shaolin monk. They are extremely dangerous, they bend, and they break. You suck! The height of your hitch should ideally be at the axle level of your rear wheel, with your bike fully loaded, including the rider and any pillion passenger sitting on your bike. Your trailer and your bike should be level. Slightly nose down is okay, but unless your rig is parked, your trailer should never be nose up. With all the different motorcycles available, past and present, you may not be able to purchase a hitch to suit your specific bike, which means you may have to make your own. If you're making your own hitch, getting this height spot on can prove quite difficult. This is my own hitch, which I designed and manufactured. It looks too high, doesn't it? But this bike has a lot of suspension travel. With the trailer connected and with me and the missus on it, the connection is at the correct height. Here it is loaded up with just a trailer attached and 12 kilos of tongue weight. If you are going to make your own hitch, I recommend using solid round bar steel about 20 mils in diameter. It's relatively easy to bend to shape using a pipe bender. It's strong and very good to weld. The distance between your connection point and the rear wheel should be close, but not this close. Missed it by that much. While still allowing the rear wheel to move up and down without any obstructions. The further away from the rear wheel it is, the more your trailer will affect your bike's handling and stability, and the lighter your bike is, the worse this effect will be. Think of it as a seesaw, with your rear axle being the centre point. Unfortunately, with some bikes like this one, having a close connection may not always be possible. Y'all ready for this? The key word here is safety, and the first reason why you should actually use safety chains is that it's the law. The second reason is that you do not want to be responsible for killing someone if your trailer does happen to break loose and go careening down the road. Always use approved safety chain stamped with its strength rating. For motorcycle trailers, 6mm will do the job, as even 6mm safety chain is rated to at least 750 kilos. When connecting the chain to your motorcycle, do not use these S hooks on the left. These two are the end result after a motorcycle trailer lifted off the tow ball. Ah, oh, crap! Use D shackles, bow shackles, or quick links, as none of these will straighten out under extreme load. If your chains are welded to your trailer chassis, at least 50% of the chain link should be welded on each side of the drawbar, not underneath, and in the horizontal position only. <laughs> Alternately, you can use these brackets and have them welded or bolted onto your trailer. Your chains also need to be as short as possible, but long enough so they don't pull tight when turning sharp, and never allow your safety chains to drag on the ground. 
Two chains are safer, with the chains crossed underneath the coupler. So if the trailer does become separated from your bike, the coupler will land on top of the cross chains rather than digging into the road. If this happened, it would be catastrophic. A bonus of this cross configuration is your chains won't come up short in tight turns. You will also have much more control over your trailer as opposed to if it was just dangling around by a single chain. If your trailer does happen to come off your tow ball altogether, use as little braking as possible to slow down, or you will run the risk of your trailer hitting your rear wheel. If this was to happen, it's not going to be pretty. You might also want to get yourself one of these. Yes, you definitely should grease your toe ball. Let's have a look at the reasons why. Grease reduces friction. The grease will help to protect it. If you apply grease to your toe ball, it will be significantly quieter. Even though you can buy special toe ball lubricant, in all honesty, you can use any general purpose grease. But you will need to wipe it down and re-grease it occasionally, or the trapped dirt will act like sandpaper. Dry film graphite lube is another very good option, as it actually bonds to the metal, doesn't attract dust, and doesn't transfer to your clothes or your hands. Let's look at something that most of us have done, or still do, and that is carry a cooler on the drawbar of your trailer. There are, however, some issues which are associated with doing this, and these are Anything that you put on your drawbar will end up getting very dirty from your rear tyre. This significantly reduces the amount of time your ice will last. Why some manufacturers still persist in making cooler covers which are black is just totally beyond me. <laughs> if at any stage your trailer does begin to sway, slow down by reducing your speed gradually. Then, when you finally come to a standstill, determine what's causing the problem and correct it. As an alternate to having your cooler mounted on your drawbar, consider using two smaller coolers and keeping both of them inside of your trailer instead. I will explain my reasoning a bit later in the video. You can then use a drawbar for something else, which will leave your tongue weight unchanged, like a front storage pod. This will gain back the space you lost with the coolers now being stored inside of your trailer. These front mounted pods make an ideal place to mount your power systems, to power your adventures, or even an air compressor, which is always handy, maybe even a fire extinguisher. They are available in plastic, steel or aluminium. Underneath your trailer is an ideal place to keep your spare wheel. It takes up no usable room and helps keep the centre of gravity low. You can mount it further forward if you need to, as this may help you to get your tongue weight correct. Hopefully you shouldn't often need it anyway. On the sides of your trailer and above the axle is a very good place for any fuel and water storage. Have one on each side though as side-to-side -side weight distribution is just as important as fore and aft. Note how high this trailer is off the ground. If this trailer was to have a good independent suspension set up, instead of the axle being here, it would be about here, significantly lowering the whole trailer centre of gravity. It's a shame that more manufacturers don't go to the trouble of having the bottom of the trailers below the frame, like in this Aspen camper. This not only lowers the centre of gravity, it also gives you extra storage space and plus your things won't slide around everywhere. Sadly, Aspen are no longer manufacturing camper trailers, which is a real shame because they are a very impressive trailer. While most camper trailers are shaped like a box, there are a number of motorcycle cargo trailers on the market these days 
that do try to have improved aerodynamic characteristics. Not only are these trailers more attractive, but having a more pointed or rounded nose will help the air to flow more easily over the top and underneath of the trailer, resulting in better handling and lower fuel consumption. Time Out Trailers has tried to address this issue on their campers by adding a fairing to the front of their trailers. G'day. Have a beer, mate. The reason I mentioned previously for having two coolers is to use one cooler for your food and one for your drinks. Your drinks cooler is going to be opened a lot more frequently, which means it will warm up much more quickly. But your less frequently opened food cooler will remain cooler a lot longer, preventing your food from spoiling. You can safely consume a warm drink, but you definitely should need a warm chicken. <coughs> Stored inside your trailer, your coolers are more secure and will always still be there at the end of the day's riding. If you are going to store your coolers inside your trailer, it's a good idea to have a light coloured trailer. The darker colour your trailer is, the hotter it will get inside. And just to make you aware, trailers made of fibreglass stay much cooler inside than steel or aluminium ones. Fibreglass is such a good insulator in fact, that a black fibreglass trailer would probably still stay cooler inside than a white steel or aluminium one. Nothing should go into your cooler that's at room temperature, including all food containers. Plastic milk containers are ideal for this, because when they thaw out, you can use the water inside for drinking. Do this by using crushed or cubed ice to fill in any gaps. Any meat which isn't going to be used on the first day should be frozen. This can then be counted towards the ice part of the ratio. And minimise the number of times and how long it is open for. Whether you drain the water from your drinks cooler is up to you, but if you leave it in, it helps keep the inside temperature of the cooler lower for longer, even if there's less ice inside. There's not a huge difference, but I did research this point and it is in fact true. If your bike has chain and sprockets, you have an advantage because you can easily lower your motorcycle's gearing, making it easier to tow your trailer. Consider reducing your front sprocket size by one tooth. This makes a lot of sense if you regularly tow a trailer. If you carry extra fuel, you can not only use it in your bike, you can also use the very same fuel to light up your campsite at night and do all of your cooking. Doing so, eliminates a need to carry a special fuel just for cooking alone. Part full jerry cans can explode. And never ever carry fuel inside of your trailer. Always let the fumes evaporate from any empty jerry can before closing the lid. This will eliminate annoying chain rattle. You can even make your own by using an old bike tube.
the strain on your motorcycle's clutch will be greatly reduced, as all your motorcycle is doing is straightening the trailer out, not pulling all of the weight. Give it a try. If you are slowing down, your trailer will always be wanting to go straight ahead. If you must brake during a corner, you should lift your motorcycle up and try to straighten your rig out, otherwise your trailer will try to push your rear wheel out from under you. So there you have it. If you've watched all three videos in this series, you will have all the information you need to stay safe while towing a trailer behind your motorcycle. The key points being choosing the correct tyres and running the correct tyre pressures. Covered in part one. Knowing how much weight you can safely tow. Covered in part two. And three, having a correctly made and installed hitch on your motorcycle. Covered in this episode. And that's about it. Safe riding. That's all, folks.